Welcome, everybody. Welcome, um, you in the audience in Abu Dhabi. Welcome, wherever you are all over the world, to this session about educational startups. We are programming a, the German stories, which is Germany as a guest of honor at the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair. Germany is the guest of honor in 2021 and in 2022. In 2000, uh, 2021, we are presenting to you a digital program, a cultural program with authors, but also a professional program with topics of general interest about the publishing industry to hear from speakers, from people in the publishing industry and in the adjacent industry, where they are, what, what the trends are and when we're going, especially at the time of the pandemic. But we also have a stand at the Abu Dhabi Book Fair and you can find us in Hall 8, Stand A05, where we present to you books from Germany in all different kinds of genres. And you're welcome to browse through them. Maybe you find a title that you would like to translate and buy the rights for. Um, as you probably know, the Abu Dhabi Book Fair also has a spotlight on rights program where publishers can ask and can apply for a subsidy to translate titles that they are buying at the Abu Dhabi Book Fair in person or virtually. So please come have a look at our books and we, we, would, we are very happy to see you there. But now let's get back to our digital program, which we're preparing for you now. Um, as you, you all know, at the, the times of the pandemic have been very stressful for all of us and especially for kids, for parents, for teachers. People, students couldn't attend school, homeschooling became a big thing and startups in the educational scene bloomed and blossomed and um, many, many were created. So today we want to speak to two entrepreneurs who came up with their own startups. Uh, so I would like to welcome you, Oliver, Oliver Hengstenberg. He's a tech entrepreneur and has been for over 20 years. He's the CEO of the Munich-based uh, company Cripster, which creates award-winning social creativity games for kids and um, for kids and is active in media education. Thank you very much for joining us today, Oliver. Pleasure. And we have Babar Baik. Babar is actually from Denmark. He has 15 years of startup experience and has worked with the Danish Telecom and the Society of Danish Engineers. He co-founded Write Reader, a scientifically based learning platform where K-12 students can create their own digital books while learning to read and write. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today, Babar. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, and my name is Claudia Kaiser. I'm from the Frankfurt Book Fair. I want to start off with uh, asking you, first Oliver, perhaps, uh, what made you an entrepreneur? What was it that got you, that made you start Cripster? And what is Cripster all about? Probably I'm, I'm an entrepreneur by, by heart. So I started already during, during my st uh, studies of uh, computer science at the University of Munich, started uh, always freelance work with the latest technologies. And I was all very much like a tech aficionado. I really like new tech and all the new stuff. So it was really in the dot-com uh, time when, when I started always doing freelance work, uh, already doing a lot of Java programming and really always the interest on, on the newest things, newest technologies, newest uh, possibilities. And uh, the hard focus, the, the very focus on the, on the kids games really started like 10 years ago when uh, the iPad came out with all the new possibilities. And um, with my business partner, we, we started uh, the very, the gold rush times of the, of the app store and we made a, a first painting app and uh, we got such great reviews and such a great feedback and it really encouraged us a lot. And so we really followed that path and kept up uh, developing more uh, apps in, in the sector. And so with that, we, we won uh, awards in, in, in the area. We got the Munich area connected with different institutions, which really 
boosts uh, very much and feels like really a good good um, it makes really sense to to work in this area very fulfilling uh, but then maybe later we come to to the um, perspective how um, good the business really goes in the kids area but this is the the introduction part how I came to getting an entrepreneur mm, okay so Baba you want to go ahead as well yeah sure so um, yeah thank you very much for having me uh, uh, so basically uh, my own background, uh, digital background and entrepreneurial background actually started uh, after my after I worked at Society of Danish Engineers with a couple of friends who got together. And in 2005, we actually co-founded uh, one of the first uh, independent app stores uh, where, where, where everybody could actually download apps uh, through, through the web portal. So that was kind of a really infancy of the apps. Um, obviously, that got disrupted with Apple coming out with the iPhone in 2008. Uh, and that kind of led us to, to be in the, in the app area as such. And I was doing these digital startups. Um, and in 2012, uh, I had a school teacher in Denmark who reached out to me uh, saying that, hey, Barbara, we have a big problem in education. Uh, 15 to 20% of all the students that leave 10th grade in Denmark are functional illiterate, meaning that they're struggling with basic reading and writing skills. Now, coming from an engineering and digital background, that was kind of very challenging for me. I, I remember one of the first questions I asked uh, my partner, the school teacher, uh, for how long have you been teaching our kids to read and write the way we do? And he was like, 250 years. Uh, and I was like, okay, uh, I'm in, because obviously uh, coming from a ba digital background, you can always find, find ways to, to make things better. Uh, so I quit my job and he quit his teaching job and then we founded uh, the company Right Reader. Um, I have a small presentation. It will take me five minutes just to go through and let me just try to walk you through our, uh, what we actually do. So Right Reader is basically a, a digital uh, learning platform where students, they can become authors from an early age. When we talk about functional illiteracy, we actually uh, spent two years in scientific research and found out why this is actually. So when it comes down to one factor, it's about motiv motivation. So how can we motivate children from an early age so that they can realize what real life literacy is? And when they're five, seven years old and they have their first book in their hand, now they will realize that, okay, this is why we need to excel in reading and writing. So our goal is, is, is basically enabling kids to becoming proud authors from an early age and basically show them what how powerful the written language can be. So in one sentence, you can say that with Write Reader, you can practice all language domains, reading, writing, listening, and talking. But besides that, also presenting, collaborative, uh, working with others, critical thinking. So our platform is based, uh, it's a web-based platform. It's not an app which you download, so it works on all browsers uh, because we know that schools and parents are using different devices at home and it scales automatically uh, towards the device which you are using. Basically, it's, it's a place for kids they can have their digital portfolio of their self-created books. They can use their any interest they have and create their own books and have a portfolio there where the teachers and parents can support them and provide them with feedback. This is how the tool looks like itself. And this is actually, last week we did an Arabic version uh, uh, of our tool uh, where kids, they can import images, and they can do audio recording, and then they can do the writing attempt, and then they can get feedback on the written language from teachers and parents. So in one sentence, I would say that WriteReader is a multi-model book creation tool where we use images, voice, and text. And then at the same time, we have integrated with, uh, with speed synthesis. Uh, and now we're working on a machine learning model as well. The idea is that kids, they have all sort of interests. They can take whatever image they want and start writing stories about that. It can be cats, dogs. It can also be uh, about social emotional learning or environmental studies and whatever. Um, the books can be printed out in the home printer. And uh, we offer this to publishers in Denmark, in Switzerland, in Norway. We work closely with publishers and offer them our platform. Uh, we have learning efficacy on our platform. We know that kids who use our tool for six weeks, they can accelerate their literacy skills by almost 12%. Uh, and especially children from lower socioeconomical background, 
uh, can excel even more. So this was an independent uh, RCT study done by the Teachers College of Denmark with 200 students. Um, we're now working on a large uh, one of our kind in the world machine learning project where we are following more than 1500 children in, in a whole council in Denmark and we've been following them since 2018. Basically uh, documenting and, 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 and seeing how they're writing and with this we have a lot of data where we can actually combine this data and use that data to to equip parents and teachers so that they can support the kids even more. Uh, so this is a very short introduction about right. We do what we do. Uh, we all, we go directly to teachers, and but we also go directly to uh, to publishers. And I would love to engage in a conversation as well, or also on how the pandemic has kind of what consequences it it has had for for the different segments. Mm, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's something we definitely need to discuss. Um, just one question: uh, When you say you you work you work directly, you go directly to the teachers and also to the publishers. Um, what about the schools? How does how do the schools use your platform or your? Yeah. Your so what we have built is is a is a classroom product. Uh, which teachers they can sign up they can create their own classroom and then they can start right away with their students so what we're seeing is that we're, we're applying a bottom-up approach so teachers use it when we have, have a lot of teachers in the school they typically go to the school leaders and say hey we want to buy license for the whole platform for a whole school license and at the same time when we see a lot of schools in a district then they will typically go to the district level so as an example of this strategy in US, we had uh, uh, we have traffic from all over the all states in the US. And last month we closed in a, a district wide agreement with the largest district in the state of Maryland. So now right now we're onboarding 48 schools and 1200 teachers. So the idea is to apply to the teachers and then they will take it uh, to schools and districts instead of going a bottom, uh, like top bottom approach where you contact the districts and that that can be really painful and uh, uh, require a lot of resources being a startup. Mm. Uh, you need a lot of resources. So, so that's why we have, we have picked the bottom up approach. Okay. Okay, good. that sounds really interesting. Oliver, Cripstar. Tell us a little bit more about Cripstar and how you work with schools. Yes, on, uh, on our side, it's like uh, we have this portfolio of creativity apps. So to when the when the iPhone came out, you instantly saw the, the trend starting. People really getting lost in the phones, playing for themselves, just consuming, consuming stuff, and a lot like playing just for themselves. And so we saw this picture of like consuming machines who are all by themselves alone. And this is why we wanted to exactly go against those two things. So to encourage in social play and to um, engage in, in creative play. And with this, the, we have different uh, game uh, mechanics to uh, based on, on painting. So it's good for kids from five, six years to um, in, 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 in different aspects to to communicate or to realize themselves um, in, in different ways. So one one game where we got a subsidy was the, the, the paint wheel, which was really fun because it has, a, 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 at, at that time, it's already some years ago, a, a, a nice new dynamic. So the innovation aspect is always important and to really take the iPad not as uh, something where you just transport, uh, put something from the real world and just put it on the iPad. This isn't, isn't good, and isn't, isn't working, but really to take it as a, as a new medium, use the new mechanics and, and make some, something new, something more valuable. And in this regards, it's um, a, a really nice nice tool. For example, the paint, paint duo, you can play together. The algorithm at the same time on the iPad, so it's, I, I heard in different institutions they use it as kind of an icebreaker because when p new people meet up, you they, they have the games on the on the table and then you just casually play against each other. It's about painting, it's creative, it's funny, and you, you log in and then you get a rating how nicely and how quickly you, you did your painting. And so you really get um, very, very quickly into and you com communicating. So there, there's different games for different situations, which are really nice, or 
The other game is, is the, the Paint World, which is a bit higher scale. It's an in, infinite um, canvas where you can pick a, pick a tile and everybody, so the idea is every, every child, it's, it's highly monitored. So every child from, from the world can experience just with the iPad to connect all over the world with all cultures, with everybody by just painting and connecting to each other. So it's, you, you take a field and then you connect to the neighboring areas and the, the algorithm takes care that it matches well. And so you get an infinite kilt like picture and we have like 1,000, uh, 10,000 more pictures in, in this area and it's endless exploration and, and endless fun. So those are uh, the, the, the me mechanics we, we really motivated us very much. And on the other hand, it's hard in the, in the games industry to, to um, really gain a lot of money with creativity apps or like pedagogical apps. Because for parents, obviously, or teachers, it's easier to say, oh, with this app, my kid learns math and is better in school. And with this, okay, can paint better or it's like socially better. So yeah, there's a, a bit uh, a crux. But on the other hand, we get very much recognition and have a very uh, good uh, network in the area with, with educational um, institutions and do a lot of consultants and consulting in the area. And with this, um, as we are professional software uh, engineers, so we do high security apps on, on the other hand and do uh, software consulting for um, native mobile mobile phones and very in, in the high end area. So we set up the um, mobile uh, support to set up the mobile development department for, for one and one example, which is in uh, Germany, like one, one of the biggest 30 million users, the biggest um, provider. Uh, and in this area, with this area, we always do then uh, project work in, in this area and support institutions which probably and sometimes not have so many funds. And we, because we are really very efficient, we can still help them to have really uh, quick, simple solutions and still be very modern to have mobile, to be very responsive, to be uh, a mobile first, because many really have to, to do the step again. Like, at the moment, we really just yesterday launched the, the new um, Flimmo. Maybe some people in Germany know it already. F L I M M O dot D E. It's for for parents guidance to to select good good movies, good TV shows, and it's very high quality. It's around for 20, 25 years, and uh, it's still very much had a had a portal. Um, aspect to it, only web-based, and we were very, very happy to, to make the transformation to go to mobile and do a nice agile project with the whole team and, and go forward with this. So mm -hmm. there's the products, and on the other hand, we do the, high, uh, the, the mobile consulting. So Oliver, I just wanted to ask you, how do you work with schools directly? On, on our part, we are not directly working working with schools. We are uh, have different projects with uh, institutions which support, for uh, for example, um, kitas like um, to uh, supply them with uh, iPads and to so for example, there's one uh, institution studio in Nets. And they have their own um, group of kids who are uh, writing news and articles. And we made an infrastructure for them to, to be uh, like authors for themselves. And they have small um, um, apps for iOS and Android. And those say they can do the same, the self-publishing, like playing through, uh, writing an article, um, collecting the, uh, the data, the pictures, and publishing it on an app and then seeing the results like published to, to the world and everybody can can read read it on the apps. Mm. So it's quite similar to what you do, Baba, yeah, in a way, yeah. even though you're publishing, I mean, the, they can do their own book, uh, and their real book, a printed book. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. Um, how has the pandemic um what what kind of changes in your business um has the pandemic brought for you baba you want to start yeah sure 
So, I mean, when we talk about the pandemic in general, I think that the consequences, uh, uh, we have not seen it uh, yet. I think we will, it will require more time for us to see where this will lead to. Obviously, there has been some short-term consequences, but also but when we talk about the whole long-term, I think we still have some areas where we will see that the, what kind of consequences it, it has had. For instance, the whole literacy gap, uh, where, for instance, students in the U.S. have been away from school for a whole year. What kind of consequences will that have? We still need to see how, uh, if they will be able to recover uh, or not, you know. Uh, but in terms of business, uh, and when we talk about the pandemic, what we saw is that the markets where we had uh, good presence, we saw a huge spike and increase in usage. So for instance, in Denmark, we are working with the largest publisher in Denmark. Uh, we are present in more than 60% of all the primary schools in Denmark. And when the pandemic hit, we saw a uh, threefold increase in usage. Now, uh, but in the markets where we didn't have that much uh, attention, we didn't see any usage. And what we found out was that obviously teachers are very, very stressed. Uh, so, and teachers, many teachers are not digital as well. So the whole uh, teacher feedback was that the tools which they had used previously and which they felt, felt comfortable with, they started to use, uh, use those tools but they didn't have the kind of uh, resources or the capacity in order to learn new tools because the time was not there. So whatever tool they actually knew on beforehand, they started to use those tools much more, uh, but uh, initially didn't have uh, the, the kind of time and resource to, to uh, or neither they got that necessary training from, uh, from, from schools or, and time in order to uh, train into new tools. So that was what we saw. The markets where we already have traction, we increased by, by three times. And the markets where we didn't have that much traction, we didn't uh, increase at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and for Cripster? Yes, for obviously the, the digital products, it, there, was, there was a really good increase, uh, a, a bit more, in um, what I hear around with, with colleagues, uh, the, there's really very high high pitches going up. And uh, yeah, obviously this is a, is a good time for, for games, for, for online, for, for digital communication. Um, for, for us, uh, it was interesting because even the, the state of Bavaria um, offered a subsidy to, 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 for a project for, for uh, media literacy. So for for kids to uh, to learn about misinformation, about bullying, about because there was such a big big shift or is already a very big shift to do con conversations, doing live online, and mostly the rules which apply in real life somehow get lost on the way to digital, like having respect, being nice to each other, thinking before you speak at some times. Uh, so there is a, this, there was a nice project. We, we didn't win the, the project, but another nice company. And I'm really curious how, how this works because this is one thing which got, especially for, for us in Munich, very obvious what I saw with, with the other institutions, what all, all the feedbacks we had in the media, that there's a big lack of media literacy and it's not foreseeable that this improves very quickly. So I think like Baba, it's a, it's a great, great project to, to support people to do early on. And then regarding the, the content to, to get the kids even very important to the, to the important topics about like, for example, with the, with the pandemic, the, the misinformation about, about the virus, the misinformation about we have a very, uh, a very, very privacy first and, and really excellent app, which is state funded, which makes it like people doubt it a little bit, but it's really privacy first. It's like uh, Apple and Google supported it with the Bluetooth beacons. You have uh, no, no context is completely anonymous and it helps even to support when you, when you get a, um, um, if, if you should have co uh, Corona or, or COVID, um, you just do it anonymously and you don't even 
need to um, send data to the Gesundheitsamt. So though they, they had too much to do already, there was a big lag in the digitalization too. Um, as we saw, they still used the fax machines. So this, they say it improved already, but this, this is really what worried me a very lot that in, in, in society, the, the misinformation is, is so, so hard to, to, to come by and um, to, because people really quickly can, can get lost in their own bubbles. They can just like block different news sources and to, to have this, uh, this, this awareness about, oh, I'm thinking very much in this direction. I should have a look at the opposite direction. Maybe there's a truth in the middle a little bit. This is what, what, what mostly I experienced during, during the, the pa pa pandemic. Mm, yeah. Is that something that's also in Denmark? Is that also, um, does that also play quite a big role? Uh, I mean, you can say that a, a big difference uh, in Denmark compared to the rest of the world is that Denmark is a very, very digitized country. Mm. Uh, when we talk about uh, as in general, um, all the mail, there is no physical mail. Everything is digital for okay. all the, all the <clears throat> residents in Denmark, even elderly. Uh, you need to have a, uh, in a, a kind of like you have a digital account where all information from the government is uh, is through uh, your digital ma mailing system. Uh, and when we talk about education uh, specifically, before the pandemic, uh, all the digital uh, curriculum was representing more than 50% in Denmark. This means that schools, they have, uh, they use more than 50% uh, of all their curriculum is digital. Uh, and so you can say half would, would be analog books and half would be digital portals. That was before the pandemic. And now I'm quite sure we're, we're up against maybe 80% of all mm -hmm. the curriculum in the Danish schools, all the way from, uh, from kindergarten to, to high schools would be digital. So every uh, child in Denmark have a Unicode, which they use uh, to log in to their uh, digital content and curriculum and whatever things they do, the teachers can follow them and, and support it by the parents. So, so Denmark is generally a very, very wow. digitized country. And you have uh, internet uh, accessibility in all schools in Denmark. So every, every child has. And when we talk about equity, even if uh, the students are not able to uh, we have kind of a bring your own device um, strategy in Denmark. So every child, they bring their own device to the school. But if uh, in terms of uh, if the parents or kids, they're not able to afford it, then obviously that it, that will, will be provided by the school. Um, so yeah, in general, uh, in general, Denmark is a very digitized uh, country, I would say, and and the trust is very high to the government as well. So now, uh, if the government says wear mask, everybody wears mask. If the government says schools are off, you know, they have support in general. You can say. Wow, it's not quite like that in Germany, is it, Oliver? It isn't. It seems like quite quite the opposite, yeah. Uh, and obviously also when we talk about parents versus uh, teachers, uh, the parents are actually looking for advice from the teachers. Okay, what apps should we use at home? What tools? Uh, they are actually expecting the, the schools and teachers to kind of put the stamp on credibility and say, we use this because if you just go on the app store, you will find 100,000 apps within the education categories and mm, parents exactly. doesn't have the necessary skills to say, to see what is good, what is bad. Just because something looks good on a device doesn't mean that it has learning value. You know, just the point which Oliver also mentioned that, you know, the social play and the creativity, and that's where we need to go he be heading instead of popping ABC balloons on a different planet has nothing, no learning value for, for the kids. We actually have a professor in, in Denmark from the pedagogical university. And he used to say that in best case scenario, the students will not become stupid if they use all these uh, standard apps from the app store. And that is also why I personally believe that Apple and Google have a huge responsibility, not only to look at design when they approve app, they should be looking at the learning value when they approve apps on the app store. Mm. Yeah, Oliver? That, that's that's a really that's a great point because it's I would love that they could do it. I um, tried to contact Google Apple in these regards because I got uh, requests about 
from in, in the educational area. Can can you help me with the list of valuable apps, which are really like this is good for teaching, like having a, a, a real real uh, valuable in in a specific area. And when you when you look in the app store, you get like okay, this is for this age, and it's all very colorful, and this is for action, and this is for but it's not there's a there's a gap in this area, and I feel like it's. If I foresee it, it, it would be challenging for, for Apple and Google. I, I, I would welcome it if they could do it. I'm not sure if they, they have the competency to, to do it or want to, to take the, the responsibility for that. And what, what I'm seeing is in, in the area, we, we have like subsidized projects by, by institutions to, to fill this gap, to you have on one part you have it co commercially like your blog and people who do discussions about right nice apps uh, this is like from the beginning from the app store it's it's really it's really a mess it was in the beginning finding stuff and it improved but i think in the, in the like 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 in the very specific area for for teaching we we still have um, the, there's a lot to fill to to have really a structure in, in Germany, for you would love to have something for for, for teachers to have, okay I have this cur curriculum in, in the different Bundesländer, and then just pick pick the apps and then you maybe you, you can decide but you know those apps are really near with the cur curriculum. There's a lot of companies who, who try to do this. I heard a few which are successful, which already sold out, <laughs> so 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 sold it, um, but. It's in, especially in Germany. It's uh, there. There is. Um, it, it's not yet foreseeable that this this is possible, as far as I as I can see, and I, I don't see it um, to having a, a, a digital curriculum with saying you have to fulfill these criteria with your apps or with your platform, and then it's okay for the schools, and then you get funding. This is completely not here at the moment. I would mm -hmm. I would wish for it. Mm, yeah. Talking about funding, um, not everyone um, in the audience who will listen to it in Abu Dhabi and uh, on the different channels will be familiar in how you get your funding. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Baba? Yeah, so um, we are uh, kind of self-funded as such. Uh, we we had uh, we participated in some early accelerators back in 2015 um, in Silicon Valley, and we got Intel Education on board as an investor as well. And uh, we got some strategic funding from the Danish publisher, whom we have an agreement with. But it's not like that we have been on a uh, ride to uh, to get venture capital uh, raising Series A or Series B round. Uh, that has not been our mission as such. Uh, mm -hmm. our, we are, we're like more like mission driven. Uh, we would like somebody on board who understand the long term value as well. And uh, not, it's not just about showing some good numbers and then doing an exit in two years time. So we have picked a strategy where we say, OK, we want to be a company where we can show learning value and where children can develop their literacy skills. Uh, and that is basically our, our main focus here. Um, and so we have gotten some funding in terms of uh, from the Danish Innovation Fund in order to do this machine learning project um, and things like that. But other other than that, we uh, we are we're kind of self uh, self funding with with the license agreements which we have uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. And do you? Yeah, you said you you have agreements around the world. That's also some uh, very interesting and something that we would that I would like also like to talk a bit about um, the international cooperation. But um, coming back to the funding and the business model behind it is the funding, and at the same time you're selling the services to the school. So is there a subscription fee or a user fee? Yeah. So the business model when we talk about about our agreements with publisher is a yearly license fee. And then we provide them with a white label solution, which we call it. So this is a branded solution in the publisher's name deployed on the publisher's domain. So, but we manage, we support, we uh, do everything, but on the front end, it just looks like that this is the publisher, which is offering a version of right reader. Mm -hmm. uh, and then our straight uh, model where we go directly to teachers, especially in the US uh, through writereader.com 
teachers can sign up for, for a free account. And if they would like to utilize our premium features or create more than 60 books, then they can upgrade. Uh, so that's purely a SaaS model, which we are applying uh, towards teachers. Mm, okay. And Cripster, how does that work with you? Funding and the... Actually, in, in our area on, on stage, state and, and nation level, there's Uh, there was some movement. So uh, here in the state of Bavaria, there's a when when you're in the games area, there's a, a nice funding possibility with the FFF, the German Fernsehfonds, and they have a, a games funding tool for making concepts, for creating prototypes and doing pr uh, production, which then I think already goes up to a few hundred thousands, um, and this. Pattern for us work, worked worked nicely uh, at the time with the the paint duel, and we got the the prototype subsidy, and this really helped us to to realize the the project, and with this then we we won a German computer game award which had um, like I think 70,000 uh, euros as well for for the winners, and this helped us uh, really really a lot to 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 expand the company a bit. Um, what's really nice on the on the other hand in Germany, uh, a development from last year, end of last year, is uh, the the nationwide games funding. So when you have at least some game mechanics in, in the educational area, this could be like in the in the serious game sector. This could be really interesting, and this goes up to um, I'm I'm not sure at the moment how many in, in the millions area this this goes and um yeah this 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 helps helps a lot and i, I know a, lo a lot of colleagues who, who who use this to really do a solid plans for the next three years to do good calculations and helped helped out very very much mm -hmm. and what about investors in your case in our case we are really we we, we had some connections and some talks but We really were just happy with uh, being self-funded and mm -hmm. really having the control on, on ourselves. And uh, especially as it is not a, a very specific, it, it's a portfolio of games we have, but we still, um, it, it's, it's driven a bit more idealistic. So we... Uh, really want to define and, and be flexible and don't want to be uh, um, revenue focused, but mm -hmm. want to be idea focused in this area and still make it work, <laughs> which, which is a challenge, but um, which, yeah, as you know, if you're self-funded, you, you, you got your freedoms, you know, on the other hand, you might, might get uh, a lot of, of work and, more layers of, of overhead for managing your company where you really have to see if it, it it's if it's worth it so if you get like to 40 people 100 200 people like getting a big company sure but for us it's really we were happy to to be in a, in a fast small small team mm -hmm. and Barbara also mentioned about uh, international corporations do you have that as well Stuff. So um, international corporations, um, not not di not directly. So we uh, obviously all, our our apps are are all international, and um, so when we do development work, obviously we 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 work with with companies. Um, all over the world. Uh, currently, we, um, we are working with the team in Hungary. And um, so this is for, for, for development work, which is, especially in these times, it's, it's all, when, when you do software, it's, it's really all remote work and mm. building up the teams. That's... Okay. Mm. Baba, you want to tell us a bit more about your international corporations? Uh, yeah, so I mean, early on when we made the uh, agreement in Denmark, like we made an exclusive agreement with the, with the leading publisher in Denmark, uh, then we couldn't really do anything more in Denmark besides supporting our, our publisher. So we 
quickly uh, kind of uh, looked abroad. And, I, and you can say that Denmark is a much smaller country, so you're much more kind of uh, dependent on having an international strategy. Uh, I can understand that Oliver doesn't because obviously Germany is a huge market, so you have enough within that huge market, right? So, but in Denmark, we, we need to have an international uh, strategy also as a startup because Denmark is not a big enough market as such. Um, so yeah, so we focused a lot on US. Uh, uh, currently we have uh, publisher agreements in Norway. We have uh, three in uh, Switzerland as well. Um, and then we are talking with uh, some Arabic uh, large publishing groups as well, uh, looking to, uh, to scale uh, to see, uh, because it's easy for us to uh, localize our, our platform into uh, other markets. So mm -hmm. currently on the direct side, we have, uh, we have Bulgarian, Polish, uh, Norwegian, Swedish, uh, Spanish languages enabled on our platform. So we are seeing um, traffic and users from more than 40 countries around the world who are using our platform mm. um, on the direct side. So what we're seeing is that uh, uh, the SaaS model uh, is working good for us. So we would be able to, when we can see an early uh, traffic rise. So for instance, we uh, this year we saw a traffic rise in Poland, uh, which is now our third largest market. Uh, but we didn't have a Polish version of our app. So now we have making a Polish version and trying to focus a bit more. Same thing with Bulgaria and, and Russian languages. And now we are seeing a lot of traffic from Turkey as well. So we're thinking about it, of localizing our, our platform into these languages as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, it's really up to how we see the interaction uh, on our platform and then we take a decision. Uh, we typically evaluate when entering a new market is that, okay, how is the digital penetration look like? Uh, how uh, is uh, the school curriculum? How does that look like? And can uh, do they have a focus on 21st century skills? And a couple of more factors before we really decide if we want to go into that market or not. Mm, okay. And Arabic, since we are here at the Abu Dhabi International yeah. Book Fair and we're producing this for yeah. the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair, um, you said you are in um, in talks with uh, Arab publishers to see where, where you can cooperate. Um, and how, how early did you start looking at the Arab world? Yeah, so it actually started with that we have an ambassador network. Ambassador network is on our website, all the teachers who are in love with Write Reader and they want to become an ambassador. So they write blog posts, they help us in development and things like that. And here we have ambassadors from Egypt as well, uh, teaching uh, English in, in the English schools in, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, we saw that they were using this uh, for Arabic as well. Uh, and uh, we made them write a, or, or the teacher wrote a blog post about how our tool could be used as a diagnostic tool for Arabic uh, students. And that blog, blog post uh, was widely distributed in, 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 in Egypt and the Ministry of Education in Egypt, they reached out to us, uh, one of the larger publisher group they reached out to us because they have not seen a tool like this uh, for the Arabic language before. And they were showing interest. So recently we, uh, we just uh, uh, are in talks with, uh, with one of the larger groups in Egypt in order to see if we can, uh, we can launch this uh, for the Arabic community. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it would be good to see more cooperation um, in all, all the sectors, uh, whether it be publishing or um, the startup sector. Uh, Oliver, do you have any connection with the Arab world so far? So we we had we, we have our our apps in, in the store, but no no direct direct connections sadly yet. So so you're still looking out to see how <laughs> how you can get more traction um, on the Arab market. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, um, we uh, met Barbar, uh, we got to know each other through uh, colleagues who work for Content Shift and the Accelerator program, um, uh, which is a German program and it's um, organized by the German Publishers and Booksellers Association. What kind of a role do these accelerator programs play for your startups? I think they play a huge role. Um, the value which they can add to a startup is is really really a lot um, one thing 
that you don't have as a startup is uh, resources. You have limited resources and you always need to prioritize how you would use your resources in order to move to the next level. Now, these accelerators can provide you with the resources. So for instance, they can open, open up a network to you in that specific market. Uh, for instance, if the accelerator network is not there and let's say, okay, I want to go into the German market, I will have to do my own R&D. I will have to reach out to all the partners, potential partners. And that is a process which can take years. Uh, but that time frame can be shortened significantly if you are part of an accelerator because all the connections are there already. Uh, all the network is already accessible to you through the, through the accelerator. So we have used uh, the accelerator as a growth strategy for our startup uh, and that is also how we have uh, gotten our uh, publisher agreements in uh, Switzerland uh, and traction in the US. That is through, uh, through the uh, accelerator networks. And the content shift was obviously huge for us as well as we won the competition and uh, the Frankfurter Book Buchmesse uh, as the most innovative uh, company. So that gave us a lot of credibility in the German market as well. And we actually have a German ver version now, which is launched in Switzerland and hoping to find the right partner in, in the German market. So uh, the challenges uh, for the German market for us uh, a couple of years back, obviously now uh, due to the pandemic, it might have changed, was the internet penetration in German schools. Mm -hmm. uh, which was very, very low back then. So I was having uh, conversations with the leadership team of Westermann Group and Konelsen and all the big publishing uh, groups in, uh, in Germany. And they were saying to me, hey, we like Right Reader a lot, but who do we sell it to? Uh, because schools don't have Wi-Fi. So uh, it's also about timing has to be right, you know, so we will definitely look into uh, the markets again and see if we can utilize our established network through these accelerated in order to to reach out again. Mm, okay. Have you benefited from those accelerators, Oliver, as well? From from those ones, not not. Yet. So we had the, the subsidies I, I I told you about. And um, as we are in the in the gaming sector rather with the um, mobile apps. So we, we, we meet, we, we go to Bologna each year to, to the book fair, uh, Frankfurt Buchmesse is there too. And um, so the, 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 the whole uh, uh, circle of the game international um, mobile kids apps developers, they, it, it kind of established that every year um, meets in, in Bologna kind of, and uh, gets some, some pasta and you really, this is how, how the business works. You know what is going on, how the trends are about the, the big brands. You get, get some beers with the people and, and some pasta and <clears throat> you can plan ahead and yeah, you you get kind of um, like yeah, mini, mini meetups with uh, Apple engineers really one-on-one um, -on -one to uh, and with Google and you get very much very very much guidance in in the sector though though uh, so they are really supporting the the area um, even if the the business is, is a bit hard so bigger companies come come and go kind of but there's some they which are still always around have big brands big licenses and so this is like kind of a, a flourishing society all over the world and then yeah there's uh, other occasions in, in New York and in and, and California, which are kind of established where everybody meets again and again. The um, industry is not, not as, as you know, in, in certain areas, it's, it's not so many people in, in the end. Mm. Small world. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you said, um, Barbara, that uh, your business has in the markets where you have traction has grown three times and in some markets where you don't have traction hasn't grown. But I mean, all, all together, it has grown. So where do you see um, your challenges for the next few years? I think that the challenges are, um, are that the, a general challenge is that teachers all right, we have a classroom product, which is dependent on teacher adaption. So we cannot reach the kids if we, if we cannot get the teachers on board. So the teacher 
training is very, very important. And so that the teachers get uh, more digitized. Um, so one of the challenges would obviously be, you know, if we need to increase our adaption is that the teachers uh, get the necessary digital training uh, so that they can uh, use digital products in general. Obviously, many teachers are really good at it uh, and, and, and can use different kind of digital tools, but that's definitely one of the challenges. Um, generally, when we develop something, we only ask one question, and that is, will this feature make the life easier for the teacher or not? Because teachers are stressed, they have limited time. So if you want to propose them a digital solution for their classroom, it has to have learning value, it has to be easy to use, it has to be very, very uh, efficient. Uh, because if you cannot uh, onboard the teachers, they won't use it with their, with their, with their uh, kids. So that's a challenge for everyone when they want, want to develop something for the classroom is to have teachers on board uh, recommending your, your product. And that's luckily what we're seeing in the US market. Uh, we are seeing growth and we're seeing happy teachers who are talking to, to each other and introducing white reader. Um, so yeah, so, so, so the teacher part is, is, is a big challenge. And obviously, I mean, it's not like that the market is open, you know, EdTech has, has been very competitive also before the pandemic. And what we all are competing uh, against is, again, the teacher's time, uh, because how many tools can a teacher implement uh, in the classroom? Uh, we are competing with the teacher's time. So teacher's time is uh, within a subject, you know, so, so it's not like that we're only uh, that we're only competing against other writing tools or other book publishing tools. No, we're competing against uh, all digital tools, whether it be math, science, whatever, and obviously teachers' time, you know. Mm, yeah. Uh, the publishing industry also sees that or identifies that as its big competitor, uh, at, you know, as its biggest competitor, the time, people's time, and uh, all the different tools and all the different games and all the different media they can use, yeah. Oliver? your biggest challenges ahead? Yeah, at the moment, <clears throat> it's really, um, so we are, we are very much connected and, and focused on, on the German markets and um, there to, to see solutions from, from the colleagues, which are, are a little bit more with the curriculum, which are uh, already very, very tightly um, games connected to the curriculum and how how hard is it is for them it's a kind of an ob observation mode we are in because the Germany is moving so slowly regarding just accepting digital products as um, support and, and and budgeting things like this we, we are still very much having this issue about about physical school books. How much, like Baba, you said the best one, the Carl and some, it's it's like the three big who have really tight control about uh, this, which is good on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, like big companies, innovation is always a little bit of a, a, a challenge. So I'm really curious how this develops, and um, so that. Smaller companies, at the moment, I don't see it, that smaller companies in Germany have really a, a good chance to, to, to get into the, the school systems. There, there are a few like, uh, like Anton and there are some very specific ones, um, which are with the pandemic, there was a urgent need to quickly find something to get the kids not to, like to print out your papers you already had. Some, some, some teachers did that <laughs> and just sent over via email or even via WhatsApp what you shouldn't touch as a teacher, signal maybe, but yeah, and for communication. And then uh, just the, the, the transition on, on mobile and the, the opportunities to have, to have a, a different kind of learning, which is not like linear, and face-to-face uh, -face and, and you know there's the switch, switch classroom and there's the different approaches which many people 
which I meet met already tried and are really really energetic about it and it, it's really nice, but it's it's really very very dynamic and in Germany it's a lot of like you know the the dean norm you have to have something which is really fixed and this is the way you can do it and this is good and everybody recognizes it and we are at the moment very much in in in, in flux in this regards and I hope innovation had, has a good chance there at the moment I'm not so hope, hopeful but I'm still opt optimistic but regarding the um, the base work to get really to get funding for for schools to to invest in in apps in in digital goods to support to try out the the uh, to to work with the curriculum there's, there's a big need for that so this is we we have different ideas but uh, at the moment we didn't really jump onto this because it's many companies coming and going and it's for for years so like there, there was kind of an equal product you you had about it's already five six years ago and so this, I think that there's big opportunity, like you you say, what you mentioned, it, it feels like really very, very solid going ahead. Luckily, you don't depend 100% on the German market. Mm -hmm. So otherwise you would have to plan for many, many years, mm -hmm. probably. Um, but what we do is actually when we have ideas. So when we uh, see, for example, the, the misinformation in Germany or the lack of digitalization, or different educational aspects, we try to trans transform them in, 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 in apps and games, which are easily accessible for, for many people and to, 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 to really tackle the, the misinformation aspect. For example, like what, how do vaccines work? How, how incredible is our society that we can now really do mRNA vaccines? This is like, incredible um, scientific work over, over many, many decades for uh, the, the science procedure is incredible. And this often gets lost in, in people's minds and for a reason to be um, really skeptic and this is all good, but to completely lose the trust that there's a, there's a very big situation in our society. So this is something which I'm, I'm really driven by to, and I see there is a market for, for sure. Uh, at the moment, Germany is like, I think more than 50% uh, state, state um, finance, uh, which is kind of critical too. But on the other hand, for companies which have ideas like um, educational things, we might have uh, very good chances for more subsidies in this area. So I, I think this is kind of the direction we are heading at the moment. Mm, okay. Right, we are coming to the end of our time, but I have one more, one last question because we are at a book fair, and um, as you probably know, in most of the Arab countries, the book fairs are often used to sell books as um, opposite the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is um, about selling rights or dealing with rights, trading rights. Um, many book fairs in the Arab world are about selling books. So, what do you what do you think? And the publishers um, in the pandemic. As you also know, some areas, some countries have benefited, like New Zealand or Australia, where the publishing industry has grown. Um, in Germany, let's say, um, we saw a little decline, and we still have to catch up. But altogether, compared to that, uh, compared to other countries like India or even also the Arab world, we've done pretty well. So, what do you think? Um, where's publishing going? I mean, it's uh, it's hard to say uh, uh, where publishing is going. Obviously, we uh, we are into ed tech and can 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 see that uh, uh, the digitalization would obviously grow. That's that's for sure. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's a question about when we talk about educational publishers in the Arab, Arab world, is that how fast they will adapt to digital. That's the main question, right? Mm. So, um, uh, and obviously many publishers also in Western Europe are kind of postponing the digital transformation. They realize that at some point we will eventually need to be there, but they're trying to postpone it uh, and say, how long can we 
deal with the analog, you know, and then stay uh, analog with our curriculum. Uh, I think that the most uh, successful publishers would be the ones that uh, do a blended mix of analog and digital. Because one thing we should remember is that digital is not about replacing analog business. Digital is about adding value to the analog. And that's how we see uh, the, uh, the, especially within education curriculum, it's not about having physical books. So for instance, in Denmark, what they're uh, doing and how they are doing a blended uh, version is that kids are still using, let's say they have a physical book, they're reading about animals. And now the teacher, once they have finished reading the book about animals, the teacher will say, okay, now it's your turn to use Right Reader and write a book about your favorite animal and present it to the rest of the classroom. So you are actually combining the analog together with digital where you're giving and providing a, a, a blended experience uh, for the students. So this is a great way where digital can add value to the analog. So I think that the publisher needs to realize that the digitalization is not a threat. They should see it as an opportunity. Thank you. And Oliver? Yeah. Um I'm I'm not sure. I, I I'd love to to see the the switch to digital really, but um, the like before the pandemic, the 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 last um, status was was kind of the publishers really the, the, the books as well as working. People want to have something, and um, especially in, in the games industry or the kids apps um, industry, it kind of established that you can release a book, publish a book, and then you have probably an app as an add-on. And this works quite nicely as a, like a marketing tool. This was what seemed to really work for people, but not really having an app and then their books around it. I think there's possibilities for this, but there's like a, 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 a big company in, in Germany um, with a, Matrose, uh, and they are actually going from apps back to TV and to book printing. So regarding the the, the mixture of the media, I think like Baba said, said too, it's really the, the, the mix is interesting. Um, in Germany, especially not being afraid of digital because we over many years learned that Windows and viruses and Google is evil and all this misinformation things and never... Uh, people tried out to to work together in, in a Google Docs and saw how easy you can, can work and organize your data and don't move around words, uh, word documents and emails. And uh, so there's really different kinds of work and possibilities for, for, for us. I see there's still much years of learning. Okay. Well, yeah, so there's a lot to be done. Thank you very much, Oliver and Barbar, for giving us some insights into your businesses and the way you work and the way you work with publishers as well. So thank you for sharing with us. Um, and we hope that uh, there will be more cooperation between Europe and the Arab world also in the world of startups and especially in the educational zone. So thank you very much. And thank you, audience, for being here, for listening to us. And I hope um, we gave you some uh, valuable insights as well. All right. Take care. Keep safe. And please come to our booth and look at our books. We also might have some digital product, products there. Okay. Bye-bye.